Okay. This may be a podcast. It may not be. We'll see. Uh, this is Jeff Barr, my buddy, my one of the one of the Las Vegas crowd. I call them. You know the uh, all the Las Vegas Hoppy and Rothbardians, the guys that life longer, got, yeah, got to study with Hoppy and Rothbard at UNLV. Um, Jeff is another legal scholar and a lawyer in Las Vegas. Okay, so you and I were talking by email about um, Rothbard's title transfer theory of contract and one interpretation I have of something. And yours, and I think you're you're interested in it because you're, what was it? What was it you're trying to figure out? Uh, what's your project that you're trying to figure this out? Yeah, for? so it ultimately leads to the what I consider to be the failure of the corporation from an Austrian perspective. Oh, the corporation. Okay, all right, right. Or all business entities, not just you know the corporate form, but all any entity that has government sanctioned limited liability. And I think that's something you and I disagree on separately, but um, maybe the reason is because of this. I'm not sure. Well, um, I think this will dovetail into it eventually. And yeah, I think they, they definitely relate. Um, but because uh, my view is that um, limited liability is the natural state in a free market. Like, because in a, in a free market, the basic presumption is everyone is responsible for their actions, right? You would probably agree with that. I do agree with that. So limited liability simply says that a given person like the corporation, which is a person which shouldn't be a person under the law. I agree with you on that. But uh, the employer, let's say, is responsible secondarily or vicariously for the acts of their employees, typically under the common law doctrine of respondeat superior, which is like a master is responsible for the actions of his servants, which is sort of a feudalistic or even a slavery type notion. Um, and so limited liability comes in and says, no, now you're not responsible for your employees. Um, basically, it says the shareholders of a corporation are not responsible for the actions of the employees. And a lot of people say that's a special privilege granted to the corporation. And my view and that of Rothbard and Roger Pallon and Bob Hessen, who are all defenders of the corporation, is that, well, respondeat superior doesn't make sense anyway because you shouldn't be responsible for someone else's actions unless there's a special reason, like you you directed them to do it, or you're you know a mafia boss ordering someone, or you're President Truman ordering someone to drop the bomb. But in general, you're not responsible for other people's torts. Um, so it's not a special privilege when the government grants you this liability exemption because you shouldn't have liability in the first place. Like that's my basic defense of the corporation but the corporation wouldn't really exist in its current form in a free market because you wouldn't have legal entity status that's right um and remember only human beings can act right i mean you did point out that a corporation is not a person correct so somebody has to be somebody has to be an actor right correct and, and i and I, i'm not so opposed to managers and even some directors in some cases being liable if they have an active role in directing the um the activities of, of the underlings who commit torts, but not in sure. Of, in furtherance of the enterprise. Sure, yeah, there's all these legal things, but but limited liability doesn't exempt them anyway. It never has. Um, they're covered by DNO insurance. What limited liability does is it says shareholders are not um, liable. Mm, shareholders like, and officers. Shareholders and well, officers. Well, it may depend on the state. I, m most, most statutes I've seen are focused on the shareholder. Well, that's um, true, but but for example, Delaware and Nevada and Wyoming exempt shareholders and officers and directors. Well, I would oppose that. I would uh, 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 I would oppose that as a libertarian. I don't think that officers and directors should be automatically exempted. In fact, I don't think shareholders should be automatically exempted. I think if you have what's called an active shareholder, they would be liable too. If, if but if you have a passive shareholder who just their, their legal status is simply that they own a share in the corporation, which is simply an economic arrangement, meaning that they have a bundle of rights, which is basically two rights, the right to vote on who the directors are and the right to get proceeds when there's a dividend or when there's a winding up of the corporation. Right. right? That's Where it. does that right come from? Contract. Mm, yeah, see, I would disagree with that. Well, it could come from under the, it, I'm under saying, the current uh, system. It's, it's it's the government, right? Well, it, it, well I think that the, the, the limited liability partnerships and things like that emerged as a private, common law contractual thing, and no. then was formalized. That's just not historically true. That's just not historically true. Partnerships. 
partnerships, but they were always general partnerships. There was never such thing as limited. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not okay. That this is a legal history issue. I I think that limited liability partnerships did emerge uh, naturally um, without yeah, just, without just, statutory just, intervention. I think so, but I could be wrong. Limited partnerships, limited partnerships were particularly used in real estate. And they still are to a large extent, and in a large extent, were driven by tax, in, at least in the United States. Yeah, but, there's lots of distortions because of regulations and taxes and things but, like that. But it, it, but in general, well, in, in, form, in general, if if you forget about all this history, if you simply have a legal system that's a private property order where where private property rights are respected and people could form contractual relationships with each other, there's no way that you couldn't form a firm, call it a company or a firm. Uh, which is a, 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 a so it's a network of contractual relationships between a, a finite number of people, right? And they yeah, all have different roles and different rights. That's fine. How do you deal with the tort stuff? And that's well, what tort, I'm really interested tort in. Tort law would operate as tort law normally does. If every person who commits a tort is liable, and then probably you could extend that liability up the chain to a degree to the extent that you can show causation, right? Okay. But, but again, you have to have a reason to have secondary liability, vicarious responsibility, where you want to make a second person responsible for someone else's tort. So if a manager tells a, a truck driver to drive a truck that the manager didn't have maintained to save money, then the manager could be liable. If the directors were aware of this, the directors could be liable, right? They're, 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 they're part of the chain of causation. So it's just a, it's a matter of tort law. Yes, and I, this is the problem. And this is but, the, this but my point is the shareholders would almost never be liable because the shareholders have no active role. You, they could, right? There's nothing that they prevents could. a shareholder. They could, they like could. I said, an active shareholder could be liable, and they are under the law now. And if it's a if if it's a if it's strictly a creature of contract, right? Um, ultimately, it's going to be the the plaintiff's burden of proof to prove right. that the shareholder. Right, that the shareholder had some sort of, in, in, in your in your terms, some sort of causal chain. Yes, yes, but yes, 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 but but if you could see this, and you're you're conceding my point because, um, all the people that like Sean Gap, for example, one of our buddies. I mean, and he's a libertarian, but and especially non-libertarians, they don't think that you have to have a special showing. Um, I'm talking about the the lefty opponents of of the corporation and limited liability exemption. Their presumption is that the shareholder, by virtue of being a quote owner, is automatically liable for any torts of the corporation. And the reason is because they – I think it's legal positivism. They take the state's classification of someone as a quote owner, and they say, well, you're responsible for what – see, they, it's, they, have a, they have a strict liability view of torts li tort liability without even defending it or knowing what they're talking about because I think strict liability is by and large wrong. You know, um, uh, but again, to show vicarious or secondary liability for someone else's actions, you have to have a good reason. And it can't be because you're an owner, because in, that's just the state's classification of the legal rights that you have. OK, and I would agree with that. I, I, I would fundamentally agree with that. I would also say that the, conver the converse is true, that you don't enjoy blanket limited liability by virtue of your, the fact that you're an owner. Uh, uh, well, I, I agree with that, but I think that ownership is not – this is the problem, people. Liability doesn't come from ownership. I agree. That's liability comes from concept. actions, from actions. That's right. And a, a good way to understand that – and this is not for you, but this is for anyone listening if we re, if we publish this. Um, a good way to understand it is to think of – like if, if I own a knife… And I own the knife, and someone steals it from me, like break into my house, and they steal my knife. Now, my knife is missing. I don't have possession, but I still – we would say I still have an ownership claim to the knife, right? Like if I, I would say you still it, have title, yes. I, I, I own the knife. I just don't possess it. Yep. Now, the criminal that stole it from me doesn't own the knife, but he possesses it. Right. So if he stabs someone with my knife, he, he harms someone with my knife. He commits a no doubt. battery. No doubt then he's responsible even though he doesn't own the knife because he committed correct. the action. That's he correct. Used a, he used a means that he had possession of. Now, I'm not responsible 
because I didn't perform the action, but I'd still own the knife. So you can see ownership has nothing to do with responsibility. I agree with you again, but it so also therefore. So then you, I think when you say that you agree with my entire no. defense of the corporation, because what I'm saying is the mere status of being an owner of a claim to a corporation or its assets, which is what a shareholder is. And the mere, the second thing they have is the mere ability to vote for directors. That capacity or status does not buy an in and of itself make you secondarily liable for torts of the employees. That's all my claim is. Yeah, I, I would agree with that statement. I would agree with that statement. But you would also have to agree that, again, that the converse is true. That you may be, that there's no blanket limited I, liability. I 100% agree with you on that. I've by always virtue agreed. of the fact that you are an owner. Yeah, but but it's a burden of proof of the of the plaintiff. And no doubt, but it's a burden of the proof on the plaintiff, no matter what. Regardless. But 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 usually it would be the the direct supervisor or the managers who make these decisions. The the executives and the president, the vice president, the COO, your supervisor, your manager. Those guys are part of the chain of causal you know of causation. They they help direct what the employees do. Even the now the directors are a different issue. The directors are a little bit more nebulous. But even even they could be liable, which is why they have DNO insurance because they could be liable, right? Well, the DNO insurance. Well, anyway, well, let's bracket that because I okay. Think so anyway, agree. so that's the corporate that's the corporation issue. I think and, we agree on some fundamentals there. But but so tell but, me tell me how. So you want to, so and let me introduce briefly. So there's something called the title transfer theory of contract. This was pioneered by Rothbard and then elaborated by Williamson Evers. After getting the rough idea from Rothbard, and then Rothbard built upon Evers' elaboration in the Ethics of Liberty. So Evers and Rothbard combined pioneered this uh, different way of looking at what contracts are. And it's different because the conventional view, even among libertarians who basically took their notion of contract from the common law, the conventional view of contract in the common law and in the civil law, which is the Roman, the modern version of Roman law. So in both major private law systems in the world today, the, the continental or civil law and the, and the common law, the conventional view of contracts is, I shouldn't say conventional because convention means contract in civil law. <laughs> That's what actually, contracts are called conventional obligations in the civil law, uh, as opposed to natural obligations or moral obligations or other types of obligations or, crim or criminal or whatever. But um, Anyway, or delictual, which is torts. Um, but anyway, the typical way of looking at contract is a contract is a, bind, a legally binding obligation that arises from certain um, um, certain promises made by people in uh, that satisfy certain legal formalities, right? Right. And the legal the formality is always the promise. The promise, so, the promise, so, the promise. So, so in, in, in the common law, we would say a contract is an offer. I'm sorry, it is an offer plus an acceptance. Plus right? consideration. Plus consideration, which is the formality. And in the civil law, they don't have consideration, but they have something called cause, which is, uh, which is similar, but it, it's a little bit better. Um, so, so basically, if I, if I make a promise to you, um, which is which is one way you could word an offer in effect, and you accept it by your conduct or by uh, by a communication, and there's consideration, then there's a binding obligation, usually two or more mutual reciprocal binding obligations back and forth between us. Like I, I'm agreeing to give you title to something or payment later, either now or later, depends on the time. And you agree to give me something like title to some object that you own or maybe perform a service. But the way the law looks at it is it's an obligation and it's legally binding, yeah. which means that if you don't perform the obligation uh, specified by the contract, then you're in what's called breach of the contract. That's right. And now that you're in breach, then the, part, the party that's wronged by your breach of not doing the obligation you, you were supposed to do, their, their remedy is some remedy in the law. Now, if you had a strict God-enforced legal system, then the remedy would be make the person do what they were supposed to do. But you know, if your if your if your obligation was to paint a fence or to paint a painting or to sing a song, then the court's not going to make you do that because 
they don't have the time and resources to, to make sure you did it right. Well, now, occasionally uh, they will. Plus, it's, it's, it's almost slavery. Now you're forcing someone to perform an action. Well, and you, okay. so, and you might do a shitty job. So that's called specific performance. So the yes. law the law frowns on specific performance because it's too much of an administrative burden on the courts. And it's not really what the defendant wants anyway. I mean, the pla- it's not what the plaintiff wants anymore because the plaintiff doesn't want to force you at the point of a gun to sing a song at their daughter's birthday party. Because- yeah, but you'll see specific performance most prominently in real estate matters. And, and, and you're right. The, the yes. modern- hold on, hold on. Okay, let me get to that. I think that's a, that. So what you're talking about is when we say the courts frown on specific performance and instead they simply order the defendant to pay a sum of money, damage, right. damages, right. a sum of money. So even if I agreed to like sell you a painting in my house, or if I agreed to give you, uh, I don't know, um, a six pack of Coca-Cola that I own or a special bottle of vodka that I have, or if I agree to sell you a tract of real estate, the law calls those specific performance too because they're making you do it. And even in those cases, they tend to just say, look, fuck it. We're just going to make you pay money. But in exceptional cases, like for real estate or for a unique painting, the court will say, no, you got to turn that over because um, there's no monetary substitute for like a Dolly painting or a Picasso painting or for this unique piece of real estate because it's got a unique location. So they will make an exception to their reluctance to enforce specific performance in the case of unique personality or unique real estate. Now, I don't think that should be called specific performance because it's still not making someone do an action. It's just transferring ownership of a resource, just like with money. So I think I think that's not really an exception to specific performance. I think by and large, the courts never order you to do an action. They just make you transfer title to something, whether it's money or whether it's a, a good like a painting um, or real estate or a car or something like that. Would you? Well, let's talk that? about that because okay. you're you're right. Um, the, the modern concept of contracts is just basically a one big exercise in determining which promises are enforceable and by how much. Right. The 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 end of the day, your your damages are some approximation of restitution. Well, I would say that it's it's not really about what performances are enforceable. It's by it's it's using that as the it's like you have a beginning point of a contract and a promise, and then you have the end point of transferring title to something, which is usually money. Right. So in, in between, they use this fiction of, well, there was an obligation, and you breached the obligation. Right. And now that you breached the obligation, we can't make you do the obligation, so we're going to make you pay money. So in the end, it's like a black box where you could you could substitute for this whole analysis the Rothbardian view, which is like it's all about transfers of title to property. That's right. Right. That's right. And all of contract collapses for the first year law- lawyers in the room. All of contract law collapses into property law and tort. Correct. Correct. Yes. Well, but the modern, even, the modern even, law. Even, even tort law. Collapses. No, tort law becomes really important. Well, tort law collapses into property transfer. Too sure. Because oh, I agree with that. Absolutely. When you perform a tort, when, when you commit a tort, then there's damages owed, which is money, again, money. Now, crime is different because the crime can be punished by incarceration or something. So that's a little bit different. And it could also uh, be defended against uh, with with force. So crime is a different, slightly different issue. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna probably put a pin in that because I think that all crime is tort too. There would be no, no, no I think no, I agree. You um, you could argue that too, and I I tend to agree with that. I think basically there, there should only there should only be tort, and because tort can be reduced to property, there's only property law. Really, that's right. Yeah. That's right. If we were, but to- I'm talking about conventionally. The the the, the um, um, usually tort law deals with the tort having commit uh, been committed already, and then what the damages are. So it's it's like a contract, in or, a way. or or war. But but crime crime has uh, criminal law has provisions g- saying when. What you're entitled to do to defend yourself, for example, uh, during the commission of the crime, and that's not really uh, a contract issue. That's saying, like, look, you can use proportional force to defend yourself from an ongoing uh, act of assault and battery. Why wouldn't that be equally applicable to a tort? In 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 the natural law, in the natural, I, I guess it. Case. I guess it would. So yeah, I think in a way you're right. Tort and crime are really, in a sense, the same thing. Yeah, there's no distinction. In, in, so tort, tort law deals. Tort law deals with the aftermath of the crime already having happened, 
and criminal law deals with kind of what you're entitled to do to, to prevent it or to stop it. Well, I, I would say the criminal law is a subset of all tort law, and it's just been appropriated by the state. Yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't have a big problem. I wouldn't have a big problem with that. Okay, so, so, so let's talk about the title transfer. The so the title one. transfer theory contract, Rothbard says that, and I'm basically interpreting him a little bit because Evers and Rothbard were not legal theorists. So they were not. They didn't go quite far, and they and I think Rothbard made a few mistakes in his I own agree. application of his theory, like with debtor's prison, which we can get into. But um, and this Maybe. implicit theft idea, which gets into this future title transfer thing that you and I were talking about in email. But um, uh, what Rothbard says that uh, promises by themselves are not enforceable. Um, and I, I don't remember if he says this or if other people say this, but so it in contract law, the reason given in 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 legal theory the. The reason given by judges and by legal theorists as to why a promise that you make to someone should result in a binding obligation, right, which results in this contractual obligation, the reason they give is what they call detrimental reliance, right, which is the idea that if I make a promise to you and you rely upon that promise and you change your position, assuming I'm going to perform, and then if I don't perform, now you've been made worse off. Like yes, so Lon Fuller called that the… Long forward called that the tort of harmful promise making. That's what he right. called detrimental reliance or promise. Detrimental stuff. reliance. But but the but the problem with that theory, as Randy Barnett and others have pointed out, is that it's circular reasoning because, because the theory always says that you're if I make a promise to you and you rely on it, and then if I don't perform and then you sue me for breach of contract because I didn't perform and it harms you, your reliance has to be reasonable because you know, what if I just say Look, I promise I'm going to go see this movie sometime in the next year, and so then I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> and then you go do something in reliance on it. It's like, dude, you had no reason to rely on what I said. It wasn't reasonable. That's so right. there's always a reasonable reasonableness re requirement. And the problem then is that there's a circularity because if the law doesn't enforce promises, then your reliance on my promise is not reasonable. Like it's on your, it's up, it's up to you. Yes. You're, you're, you're taking the risk that I might not perform. And that's totally up to you. If the law does enforce promises and then you know you can rely on my promise, then your reliance is reasonable. But you can't use that to say what, what the law should be because then that's circular. Yeah. So, I mean, so, again, the mo I would say that the modern law takes, as you said, a big black box. They put all the promises in the world into the big black box and they shake it under this. Under the you know they have this the consideration sifter and those that fall out that have consideration they get enforced and then yeah. they sh sift it again under the promissory estoppel detrimental reliance sifter yeah. and those that fall out get enforced yeah. and then they finally there's a third one uh, under the concept of unjust enrichment or restitution if I confer some yeah. benefit on you yeah, they there's... shift they shift it again and those promises correct. And the so, civil law doesn't have consideration, but it's, it has to have cause, and there can't be mistake, a certain type of mistake, and and you you have to have capacity. Like if it's a twelve year old making the contract, then that sure. doesn't count. There's all kinds, but in the end, basically the legal system says some promises count, right? They satisfy our formalities, right? And those, when the other person relies upon it, it is reasonable, and therefore, if you don't perform your promise. Is to their detriment, or you're harming them, and because you harm them, now you owe them damages because of breach of contract. So that's right. That's the typical theory. So Rothbard never say, well, destroys that. They destroy. They say it. promising is never a basis for contract per se. Now, one thing I disagree with them on is they seem to have this mechanical aversion to the word promise. Like they say that if I make a title transfer, that's fine. Like if I say. I hereby transfer to you – like you transfer to me $1,000 now. Let's take a simple example. You transfer to me an orange, and I transfer to you two oranges in a week. Like that's our deal. Sure. One orange now for two oranges in the future, okay? So I'm hereby transferring to you two future oranges, okay? Um, he says that's fine. That counts as a contract. Uh, but if I say I promise to give you two oranges, that doesn't. I think that's ridiculous because I think if I say I promise to give you two oranges in a week, that could be taken as a communication of the same – like 
we, we don't have to be sticklers for language. It's like about it's it's about what's communicated and what the intent is and what's what the context and what the social norms are. If I I don't think it matters if I use the word promise or not. I, I don't disagree with you. And, and sometimes that elevates form over substance for sure. Mm -hmm. But I want to back it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what title is, because I think you you point out very trenchantly that it's re really need to start with the concept of what is title, what is ownership. And we use those sort of interchangeably. And um, and I think, again, you point out, I'm going to paraphrase here, you feel free to clarify, the title really comes down to the ability to exclude others. And it really stems from, I'm the prior owner, I'm the first owner, I get to exclude all others by virtue of the, I'm a prior owner, let's just use that. Yeah, I get to leak. Yeah, so so uh, yeah. Well, being the being the first, the, that's the that's the the justification basis for why you have the claim. But the claim in itself is a is an exclusion claim. That's most right. people don't understand this. They th most people would say simplistically that, well, I think title and ownership are synonymous terms. I do think they're. I agree with terms. that. I think ownership and ownership and property rights are synonymous terms. Saying I have a property right in a thing. Or I'm the owner of the thing, or the same, they're the same. But state. I disagree there because you can have less than complete title. You can have less than absolute title to a piece of property. I agree with that. So, so saying that I own it and that I have some sort of title. So, well, let's back up. Well, ownership, ownership can be ownership can be contextual and partial too. I mean, I think they're the same thing. Okay. But ownership, can, ownership can be limited. It can be divided. It can be limited in time. It can be limited in scope and duration. Uh, it can be shared. I, I don't want to quibble over ownership and title. I think I think we're all sim similarly aligned here. But yeah, 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 yeah. But, I agree. But but I, and I agree with you. The title is the ability to exclude. It's not the okay. ability. So it's it's the le it's the legal it's the legal right to exclude. Okay, but. Fair enough. The legal right to exclude, whether I have the ability to exclude or not. That's is a different legal. issue. That, so that's like that's more like the the factual ability. That's like the distinction between possession and ownership. Well, we'll so get there. Okay. We'll get there. But I just 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 so that so that we're clear that if I wanted to use force to exclude someone, that's an indicator that and I, I can legally use force, yes. whatever that means, licitly yes. use force yes. to exclude someone. Then I have that, that's a that's that's what title is. Is the I ability agree. to elicit or the 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 legal the, ability, the legal right the legal the right legal right to illicitly exclude someone? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that that's the essence of ownership. I think it's the and the reason it's the right to exclude and not the right to. So most people would say the right to own is the right to use something. Yeah. Now, as a practical matter, in most cases, when you have the right to exclude people from a given thing, that gives you the uh, the practical ability to use it. Like if I have the right to, if I, let's say I have a five acre tract of land in Las Vegas, right, and a house in the middle of it. Now, technically speaking, I don't have the right to use it. I have the right, the legal right, to exclude. No one else can use it. Correct. But if I can keep it, everyone else from using it, then I'm, I am as a practical matter free to use it. Yes. The reason, you, the reason I don't want to say you have the right to use it is because you don't have the right to use it because That's there right. are uses of it. That would violate other people's rights. Like, like if I own a gun, that means no one else can take my gun from me. It doesn't mean I have the, an unlimited right to use it because if That's I pointed right. at you and shoot it, or if I pointed it, uh, you know, across the street and the bullet goes into my neighbor's house and hits him, then I didn't have the right to do that action. Right. So if you say you have the right to use a resource, uh, then you have to say, well, then actions. Uh, then rights are limited by other property rights, but they're not. That's right. What property right. rights limit is actions, and that's because property rights are a right to exclude. So when I say I have a right to exclude someone from my house, that means that no one else can perform a given action that means they're using my house without my consent. Exactly. Right? And this seems trivial, by the way, but I think a lot of people don't think about it this way, and once you do, a lot of things become clearer. Yeah, right. it becomes a negative state. rights versus positive rights. Exactly. Yep. Negative rights versus positive rights, um, the, the, the essence of property rights, and so on. Okay. And it also makes clear what the object of rights are. Like the object of a right is always some physical scarce means that is a means of action that people can have a conflict over. Correct. That's what the object is. And there's another twist too, which is interesting. So 
and you hear this from kind of a, a, a flippant lefty types who say it's like the tech people who say oh like when we libertarians say we, we favor in america uh decentralism or states rights they go states don't have rights it's like okay we know we're not saying states have rights what we're saying is the federal government has limited powers and that's our way of explaining this concept to you but it's, it's the same way when they say um well pro when i say we have property rights they say property doesn't have rights it's like okay well i know but but the point is what a property right is it's a right to exclude that's right that's what it is However, a property right is not a right between me and a resource. That's right. It's between me and other people. Correct. So a property right is a right between the owner and the rest of society with respect to a resource. But the right is the right to exclude. So it's a right to exclude all these other people from using this resource without my permission. That's all it is. And when you understand it that way, then you understand that what contract is, it's a derivative of this ownership right because – when I say I have the legal right to exclude someone from using a resource without my permission or consent, that implies that there has to be or there could be a communication between us. The communication by me as the owner of whether I am or am not granting consent. That's right. So I have to tell you whether you can use it or not. And then th this gets to your thing about property not it's not always absolute and titles not always absolute. Yeah, so my my consent can be can be limited or it can be absolute. Sure. Or it can be conditional or unconditional. It can no be doubt. present oriented or future oriented. It can no be doubt. reciprocal or, or or gratuitous. Like it could be a donation or a yep. gift, or it could be uh an exchange with other things interacting. So it could be all these complicated things. But ultimately, contract comes from the ability of the owner to exclude by making a communication saying you are. Or you're not permitted, and in the to use this resource, and in the reductive case, it could just be about your body. Like a girl could say, "You can kiss me," or "You can't kiss me," because right. I own my body, and I'm giving consent or I'm not giving consent. And if if the boyfriend kisses her with her consent, it's not assault and battery. But if he, someone kisses a girl without her permission, it's battery. Correct, it's, it's and trespass. that consent can be withheld. But as you point out, it's always the latest, the later. Of consent. course. And the reason it's the latest is because we're always talking about what someone's permitted to do now in the present. And the answer is whatever the owner says. Now, it's reasonable to assume that their last standing order, so to speak, is the one you can you can assume to be operative. Like if sure. I have if a girl's been on a date with a guy for a year and every date at the end of the date, he gives her a kiss. She doesn't need to sign a written contract beforehand on the on the tenth date saying you can kiss me. He's assuming that her consent from the last time is is going. But if she change if she changes her mind at the last minute, that's the op. Even if she promised him promise again promise at the beginning of the date tonight, if you take me to a good movie when you drop me off at home, I'm going to give you a nice smooch. And then he drops her off and she goes, I've changed my mind. He can't just say, Well, sorry, you promised me earlier. That's right. She's revoked her consent. She has the right to revoke her consent because she, she has the right to be clear. She's revoked a property right, or a, uh, when you say consent, she she previously permitted the suitor to give her a kiss to invade her. Well, say she previously she previously told him at the end of the date you can kiss me and you don't right. need to ask my permission. I'm I'm telling you right now it's fine. I think he's entitled to rely upon that and to to act upon that. Uh, unless she unless she communicates, no, no, I've changed my mind. Right, but that's her exercising her property right, right? Yes. It's, it's withdrawing consent. It's I'm excluding you from. And, and that's what contract is. Contract is a communication by an owner about what other people are entitled to do with their resource. That's, that's right. what That's what contract is. I would agree with that. And typically in a commercial sense, it usually boils down to commercial transactions and usually trades of of titles to property we'll or get titles of property for services. So it's right. usually that in the usual case. Let's, let's, I just, I want to be very, very clear. Okay. Now that we've kind of tied up what, what title is, yes. you would agree with me that title and possession are different things. Absolutely. Okay. Possession is, title to possession something, is, we talked about this. Well, hold on. Possession is a factual and economic thing. It's, it's, it's the, it's the 
possession is something that Robinson. So we the reason Rothbard and others use Crusoe examples, which is they isolate one person as a human actor on an island uh, apart from society, is they're trying to isolate certain features of human interaction and action. And so Robinson Crusoe on a desert island has to use scarce means to act, right? He has right. to gather firewood and catch fish and get clothes and all that stuff. Um, so he has scarce means of action and he possesses things. He uses them. That's right. But he has no ownership because there's That's no, right. he has again, no earlier we said ownership is a relation between people right. with respect to a resource. If there's no other people, there's no relation between other people. That's there's right. no property rights. There's no ownership. The problem is people use the word ownership in a in a in a um, in a uh, casual way as a synonym for possession, like to say I own my bitcoins. It's the best form of ownership because no one can take it from me. What they're talking about is possession, and they use the word ownership because the purpose of ownership is the legal system is trying to give you the secure ability in society to to have possession that's undisturbed by other people by establishing a legal rights system where people tend to uh, respect your rights, right? So the purpose of property rights is to augment possession. It's like an expansion of possession, but they're not the same thing. Yeah, okay. And, 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 and I can grant you certain rights in my property, right? If I, to the extent that I own absolutely and unconditionally a, a piece of property, be it a painting, a piece of real estate, a car, I can, I can loan it to you, right? Yes. I, I can, I can, Give you temporary possession. It can be that, and that's because whenever I give permission, uh, permission, it's always a communication, and the communication can have different terms, right? Sure. I can say, "Oh, I'm going to let you use my car for the day." Okay, but that means you don't have owners full ownership of it, so you couldn't sell it. That's right. And that's you, right. and if you, and if you destroy the car, like you burn it, uh, you know, you burn it as for for an act of fun. Then you're destroying my property and you're committing trespass or something like that or, or conversion or whatever you want. Yeah, to call. it'd be conversion or trespass. Because I didn't give I didn't give yep. you permission to do that. That's but right. if I sold if I sold you the car, you can do whatever you want with it. That's right. That's exactly but if I right. if I sold you a half interest in the car and I said, okay, you can use the car on odd numbered weeks and I can use the car on even numbered weeks, then we now have a joint ownership in the car. Uh, now, so the way I would look at it is from the from the rest of the world's point of view. So uh, this gets into this thing called uh, – I don't know what the, 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 the common law term is, but in the civil law, it's called in, in rem and in personum. Maybe yes. it's – so that means that um, uh, it's a personal right versus a, a real right. Uh -huh. Well, I think it's common law. Real right means realty or, or, or property right. Yes. A property right is, is, is a right you have with respect to a thing that's good against the world, even if they didn't agree. Like they that's didn't right. have to sign a contract. So if I own a house, I own that house. No one else is entitled to use it without my permission, even if they didn't sign a contract. That's but right. we could have special rights by by contract saying like, okay, you and I are going to co-own this house. That's right. So that's a contract between us. But that what that means is it's the way transfer of title people, between us, right? It is, well, I, I don't know if it's – I don't know the right way to classify no, it. No, it would be a transfer of title in the real well, estate. But But from the rest – from the point of view of the rest of the world – they see a unit. They see Jeff and stuff. And right. all they know is compared to everyone in the world, Jeff and stuff and together have a better right th to this resource than everyone else. That's right. So they got to get our permission. Right. Now, as between us, we have a contract saying, okay, Jeff can use it in these months and Stefan can use it in these months. And if we have a dispute, then we have to go to arbitration to settle our contract dispute, something right. like that. What you're talking about in the common law is called joint tenancy or tenants in common. Of course, of course, of course. Right. And and what the, the common law says is that you own that as a joint tenant. Um, you own a 50% or whatever percentage yeah. interest um, to an un, undivided whole. Yes. And, and, and maybe a better example would be like, let's say a, a father who dies and he leaves his home to his two children. Sure. And in the civil law, it's called he leaves it to them as owners in in division they call it so they both they are both co-owners in in division yep and if you had to do numerically it's 50 50 but but that means they have to work it out between themselves as to who gets to use it or how they use it and if they can't come to an agreement then they have to sell it right and split the proceeds right but right. that's not a concern the rest of the world has that's as right far as the rest of the world knows 
if one of the two owners gives them permission to use this house for a party, then they've got permission. That's right. Unless the other brother can show, oh, I've got a contract saying you can't, then it becomes a messy issue. And then everyone, then, then you have a cloud over the title and you have to basically sell it. That's right. So, so this co-ownership presumes that there's a certain cooperation between these co-owners. Always. And that's what the contract between them is. Um, and so I see no special problems with this. And by the way, I think you can use a similar analysis to justify um, something like the current legal systems of um, of trusts and of, yes. of restrictive covenants and sure. um, um, uh, negative negative servitudes or negative easements. Negative easements. Sure. All these kinds of things can be can come out from this understanding. And could be compatible with a libertarian and a Rothbardian conception of property and contract. Right, but it's but it's all related to title transfer, right? We're not talking about promises. Just be very clear, we're not talking about promises. Correct. correct. When you when you and I say contract, we're really talking about title transfers. That's correct. Okay. Evers and Rothbard demolished this concept of the the naked promise, um, and 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 in order to have an enforceable agreement, you look to whether title has transferred. And what title has transferred? You agree with that? Say that again. In order to find, so so we. You say you're saying they demolished that have naked. So well, well, so a naked promise. I think they're being a little common law uh, centric here, because in the civil law, a naked promise is enforceable. I think because no. you don't you don't have to have consideration in the in the civil. Oh, law. I see. So. So but, that's but, why but, you can have you can have what's called a gratuitous promise in the civil law, and it's still enforceable. The the point is is that we're not we're not in, in for, trying to ferret out which promises are enforceable, which promises aren't. We are trying to figure out whether there was a title transfer and the extent and scope of that title transfer. Correct. That's that's the job of the libertarian. And I think I think the reason of Rothbard and Evers is that they sense that there's something wrong with this this uh, this detrimental reliance idea, which is circular, as as other other more sophisticated scholars have pointed out, like Randy Barnett, and I agree with that. And they also sense that a promise is just it's just something you say. And it, look, if someone wants to rely on that, then that's up to them. Like if Elon Musk says, "I'm going to make Twitter," you know, a, a seven hundred billion dollar company by the end of the year. If I want to go buy Twitter stock and rely on that, that's up to me. I'm I, like, yeah, I mean, he's you know, not guaranteeing that to me. I'm just assuming he's a, a superstar. Detrimental reliance is a very small portion of the, the promises in the right. world that are enforceable, and, right? In the well, common law, the, the, the other, yeah, the other problem I think Rothbard points out is that, um, and others, I think is at least implicit, is that in, in, in a sense, it's just free speech. If I can say whatever I that's want. That's right. And so why would I be liable for saying something? So what they say is it's all about it's all about property. You own property and you're entitled to transfer it. So really, all contract law can be reduced to transfer title transfers. And That's by right. the way, if you understand that specific performance in the sense of performing uh, requiring the performance of an action is never awarded by the courts, they always just transfer title to something. Then it's even in the legal system, it always really boils down to transfer of title. So Absolutely. why don't you just why don't you just make the contracts be like that in the first place? So for example, in this system, and they don't say this, but I think it's an implication, there's no such thing as breach of contract anymore because there's no That's obligations. Right. That's so right. every contract just has a network of conditional and secondary and tertiary transfers. Like so, for example, I agree to sing at your kid's birthday party. I'll perform a magic show at your kid's birthday party, and you agree to pay me a thousand dollars. And let's say you agree to pay me a thousand dollars up front, so I know I'm going to get it. And I agree that if I don't show up, I got to pay you two thousand dollars back in damages. It wouldn't even be damages, but it's like it's like a it's like it's a, it's a uh, what do you call it a penal bond. Now there's a word in there's a word in a contract for a, a penal clause. Oh, a liquidated maybe. damages. Liquidated, liquidated damages. A liquidated damage. Which, which by the way, the courts frown on because they, they do. don't want they don't want you to blend the penal law with. So the lack of fr total freedom of contract makes people fudge things like so they pretend to give you ten dollars or a dollar for consideration because the consideration sure. formality I mean, is stupid. So people just write it in the contract. They pretend. So if the law had gave you total freedom of contract, then you could simply say, 
yeah, I want you to perform at my kid's party. Your incentive is you're going to get $1,000. But then you want to make sure they're going to perform. So you say, and, and your disincentive is if you don't perform, you owe me $10,000. Like it's really important to me. Yeah, you, I mean, you'll be free to do that kind of stuff, but you're not free to do that now because liquidated right. damages can't become punitive, right? That's right. And Rothbard and Evers, I mean, they deal with this by, by pointing to something that the common law had for a very long time, which are basically um, surety bonds. In other words, the whole the whole reason that surety bonds arose is, be, is is a common law's recognition of this exact problem with right with requiring people to perform at your Son's wet at your son's birthday. Well, party. I think the surety bond thing is similar. It's like a type of insurance, which is why the word is in there. It's yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a way of uh, handling the risk, and the risk is this: that if the other party doesn't perform, okay, legally, they might be on the hook for damages. But what do you? Okay, what good does that do you? Like, because the guy might be long gone, or it might be too expensive. Right. To but that, I mean, that's always the problem. So, so, so you, you should say, okay, just every, you got to deposit this fund ahead of time, but that's not, that's very rarely feasible in contracts because contracts can quite often lead to unexpected or unanticipated damages. Um, well, well, or, let's, well, we'll get the damage because, because there's no such well, thing as, there's no such thing as contractual damages. Well, I'm, I, I agree. The word damages is not appropriate, but just some, some some future title transfer that can't be paid um, because it, the future sum doesn't exist or or the guy's insolvent, right? Well, um, we'll talk about that too. So, because... but my point is, I think Rothbard members over rely upon this penal bond thing. It, the same way that a lot of libertarian Bitcoin uh, space cadets do when they talk about smart um, contracts, they talk about smart contracts, which make no sense unless they are dealing only with digital assets like Bitcoin, right. because if they deal with the real world at all, the only way to make it work is to have a, um, it's, I wouldn't call it a bond, I would call it an escrow. But most of the time when, when there needs to be a loan or someone borrowing money, which is effectively what a lot of the conditional subsidiary ancillary title transfers amount to, like they're saying, if 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 this doesn't happen, then this transfer happens. But that but that transfer is always in the future. It's always hypothetical. And not, it's always conditional, and that that means it's uncertain. And there's no guarantee the money is going to be there. Well, like, let's stop right there because let's let's talk about. Well, let, let me make one point real quick. Go ahead. My, my point is this: take a simple loan contract. I'm a young guy. I just got out of college. I don't have much resources. I want to start a snowball stand. I need to borrow ten thousand dollars. And by the way, when I talk about dollars, let's let's assume that they're some kind of real thing, like back sure, by gold. Absolutely. I, I'm I actually don't think fiat dollars can be owned any more than Bitcoin can be owned. But let's let's assume we're talking about something ownable. So I want to borrow a thousand dollars from you, or the equivalent in gold, whatever, to start a snowball stand. And you want to loan it to me because you have excess cash and you want to make a return above the above the value you get by holding it, right? Um, and so I want to loan you the money, but I want to get a return, which is called interest, right? So I say, all right, I'll give you a thousand dollars if you could pay me eleven hundred dollars in a year. Right. How are you gonna pay me that? I say, well, I'm gonna take the thousand dollars, I'm gonna buy a snowball stand, and I'm gonna make a profit. And out of my profits, um, I'll be able to make some money on my own and pay you back. Right. So the lender is taking a risk that. The snowball stand idea might not work out. He knows that in a year that eleven $1 hundred dollars that he's being promised might not exist, right? So, I'm going to take a slightly different take on that. I think that in a loan transaction, Second. I borrow a thousand dollars from Stefan today for my snowball stand. So that means that you have transferred title to me. Correct. To your thousand dollars and do whatever I want. Concurrently, today, I transfer title to you of eleven hundred dollars. That's wait, payable in the wait, future. Wait, you're you're running the snowball stand now? Yeah, sure. Why not? I, I got a face for snowballs. Well, let's, let's back up. Let's let's back up up just a second for, for some clarity. 
let's take a different transaction. Let's say that, um, let's say that, uh, uh, let's say that I'm selling you a, um, uh, a motorcycle. Okay. thousand dollars. Okay. So you transfer a thousand dollars to me now, and I transfer a motorcycle to you now. That's contemporaneous. So exchange. That's contemporaneous a contemporaneous thing. And it doesn't, or maybe, 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 you, maybe I, I gave you the motorcycle tomorrow, but, it, but it's not about the contemporaneousness. But my point is that that exchange is an exchange of title for title. Correct. Now they're both uncon they're both a hundred percent title transfers, and they're each conditional upon the other. They're mutual. They're reciprocal. Right. Would you agree with that? Well, I would agree they're contemporaneous. Mutual reciprocal. I'm not quite sure. I, I don't well, know. I'm saying the the economically speaking, the reason I'm giving you my motorcycle is to get your thousand yes. dollars. Yes. And the reason you're giving me your thousand dollars to get my motorcycle. That's right. And I also will make my title transfer conditional upon you. Number one, having let's say if you pay me money for my motorcycle, you're going to make your title transfer conditional upon me actually having title to it. Maybe. And actually delivering it. Well, you could though. Maybe, right? There's you such could. thing as quick, there's a quick claim deed. I can transfer today a yeah, but, my but, interest. But, in but then it's not really an exchange, and it's two then it's two separate trans. If we're going to make this an actual a, a transaction where there's two related transfers, they're related to each other somehow. Hold on a second. No, 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 no. I can transfer all of my interest in the Brooklyn, all anything that I own in the Brooklyn Bridge, I can transfer to you right now. Yeah, you, and you can make it conditional or you can make it unconditional. That's right. That's right. That's right. But that's why it's called a quick claim deed as opposed to a warranty deed. I, I totally agree. And that's in the weeds. And I, I love the idea of a quick claim deed because I actually think quick claim deed, quick claiming, quick claim deeding, or however you want to call it, quick claiming, I think is the essence of all contractual title transfer in a sense. Well, then you're saying that there's no title. You're you're not a, you're not a, not. No, a, that's the way the law looks at it. What I'm saying is that the es just like the essence of property ownership is the right to exclude, the essence of a title transfer is you're giving up whatever rights you have in favor of another person. Like, and that's what a quick claim ultimately is. Right, but if I yes, but I'm not warranting. I'm not guaranteeing. No, there's no warranty, right? I'm not guaranteeing that I own anything. No, but 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 in the title transfer theory of contract, a warranty is just I transfer whatever rights I have in this to you, and if it doesn't turn out to be what I what I promised, then I have to transfer something else to you. So it's just like it's a it's a Be network. Careful. Of, Be careful! It's not a promise; it's a representation. I, I, like I said, the word promise is not the problem; it's the concept. It's not the word. Yeah, just but 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 understand it's it's it, 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 it's still a title transfer. Right? What, what is go back the, the, the motorcycle for the the motorcycle for the thousand bucks yeah but my, my only point is this some some contractual exchanges are title for title yes but well, some are title are, for title they're all title for title no it's not yeah otherwise it's a it's a it's not a, it's not an exchange well so let's suppose you go get your nails done at a salon because I, I think every don't every Sunday don't you go get your, your <laughs> I do I do Okay, so you get, you get your manicure, you're getting the. Okay, there's an economic exchange, but legally there's a there's not an exchange. There's a one way title transfer. That's the way I look at it. That's what confuses people. So, economically, there's an exchange because the nail lady is performing an action or a service or labor that you want, and the reason she's doing that is to get your money. Yeah, and you're giving her the money to get your nails done, right? Right. Um, but Legally speaking, there's only one title transfer, and that's the, the transfer of the of the money. Now, this is why people believe in intellectual properties. They say, well, if Jeff got an if Jeff got a uh, a manicure, then he paid for it. That means the lady sold it, so she must have owned it. So she owns her labor, and therefore, you know, so then you get to this labor ownership nonsense. That's where you get the confusion when you when you mix the realms of legal and economic description. Yeah, and so my I, point is this. My point is this. Some contracts are an exchange. Oh, oh, some contracts are a one-way title transfer, and some are, are, are mutual two-way title transfers. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. And sometimes they're contemporaneous, and sometimes one of them, at least one of them, is future-oriented. But – and that's what a loan is. A yeah, loan but, is usually but, go ahead. But I want okay, I want well, we'll get to the loan in just a second, but I do have a question about 
about the, the nails. What happens if she does my nails and I don't pay her? Then I think you've stolen from her the money that what you- What have I stolen from her? The money. The money. What money? The money that's in your pocket. That what if I don't you're have in possession, the money? That you're in possession of, but now she owns. What if I don't have the money? Then you haven't stolen anything, but but she has a claim to money that you come into in the future because that's a subsidiary. On what basis? Because, because if you had if you had sat down and written the contract out in 17 pages of legalese, you would have had ancillary and subsidiary and tertiary title transfers saying but just she like hasn't an transferred any title to anything under your theory. Here's what you here's what here's what you effectively did. And here's what I would say that the the default presumptions uh, um, of of the context and the legal community and the and the communicative framework uh, mean you both have agreed to because you would agree to that if you sat down and did it. Um, the the contract looks something like this. Jeff hereby like she doesn't agree to anything actually. That's right. It, Jeff agrees. I hereby transfer to you twenty dollars in thirty minutes. If you have done my nails, uh huh, and if it happens to be that I don't have any money in my wallet, I transfer to you twenty dollars plus interest in the future as soon as I come into possession and ownership of it. So, so let's say that you have twenty bucks in your wallet at the completion of the of the manicure. At that moment in time, you've already transferred it. So. That money is hers. She owns it now. That's but right. Your... That's the difference between title and possession. Exactly. So you have possession. She has ownership. And if you don't turn it over, now you're um, you're converting or stealing her money because you okay. refuse now to stop. give it to her. What's the difference between 30 minutes and a year? Nothing. So if I loan you $1,000 or you loan me $1,000 in an exchange for $1,100 in interest, aren't I just transferring title today? Yes. Of the eleven hundred dollars to next year. Yes, but I said in this case you had the twenty dollars in your pocket. Yeah, for sure. But you again, I could in, in thirty minutes it could burn up. I could have a moth in my pocket. Right, and if you don't I, have it, then you're not stealing anything because you don't have anything she owns. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think that's right. I don't. That's the problem. This is I, our. Problem. I don't know why that's not right, but I. Don't I know. I know, and this is the sticking point. This is this is where I think you're wrong. You, you, so this is this is it. This is the crux of the issue. Yes, this is the crux. Yeah, so I, I would say, so let, let's take it. Let's say I owe you eleven hundred in a year. Forget about the original thousand. Let's just say no. You, I, I am owed. You, you have transferred eleven hundred today. Yes, to be That's, payable. We're using the word owe and promise to substitute. But no, no the title has transferred today. It, it becomes okay. really important. It becomes no, really you're important not, because you're not transferring it today. You're, yes, you are. You're, you're, you're setting in motion your. It's sort of like when the girl says you can kiss me at the end of the date, then her permission given earlier bears upon what the other guy understands to be the permission at that time. Except in this case, she can change your mind, but you can't change your mind. And the reason you can't change your mind, well, that's a complicated issue. I'm not even. Oh, no, not if you have a transfer today. Well, but what you're okay, then it doesn't become then, complicated. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. The way this is right. This is the this is the nitty gritty. This is this work. You are transferring title today, right? You're transferring title to a future thing. That's right. But the future thing doesn't exist yet. May or may not exist. That's right. So you're so this is this is why I sent you this stuff about in the Louisiana in the in the right. civil law, something called sale of a hope, right? Which I'm sure the common law has a, an equivalent. Um, like if I tell you, uh, invest in my in my farm and and I'm going to have a crop of, of soybean and uh, you get half of whatever the crop is. Okay. So in, in nine and in six months, there's going to be a crop and you get, you own half of that crop. Right. Now, we both know that there might be a drought. There might be pestilence. There might be um, nuclear war or whatever. So the crop may be zero, but it might be a nice crop, but whatever it is, you get half of it. Right. So I'm selling you now a half interest in my future crop. So when that day arrives, whatever the crop is, you own half of it. If it's zero, then you own half a zero. That's yeah, I'm going to I'm going to be even clearer than that because I'm transferring title today. 
okay. to half of the crop. That's fine. But but the half of the crop is a future uncertain thing, and we don't know what that is. But but again, that would be explicit in the contract, right? Of course. Well, it doesn't have to be explicit. It could be it could be it could, it could be, be implied. Uh, for example, yeah. if I go into a restaurant and order, I mean that's but it has to be understood. It has to be communicated right. either implicitly or tacitly but, or something. But but the reason the reason it's important for title to transfer today to that loan in the future is because then I can exclude people later on when we talk about priority. Who gets priority on that? You, you, oh. The problem you have is is who has priority. Well, that, I, I don't think that's the problem. I think that's a different issue. I think we got to sort out the basics first before you start talking about- Well, um, I have sorted out the basics. I just disagree with your basics. Yeah, but you, haven't, you just said you're not sure why. Well, I, I, I think that it's because of transfer of title today. Now, whether well, there's a transfer I, I, well, of title on, on labor, I, I don't not, know. I'm not totally opposed to saying I'm transferring it today. It's just that what I'm transferring is a future thing. But the future, yeah. thing, the future thing is an uncertain thing. Well, I'm transferring possession of something. No, you're not transferring possession. Sure you are. No. If I transfer title today, I as the owner can go mortgage that. Title. Uh, okay. Uh, then maybe look, you cannot you cannot possess a future thing. You can only possess a present thing. Right. But I can have title do a future thing. Okay. Right? But you don't have possession of it until that day arrives. That's exactly right. That's the important But if it doesn't point. exist, there's nothing to possess. Which would be a theft, which would be it's a derogation theft. of title. It's not theft. Yeah, it, I disagree with that. It would be a derogation of title. I don't know what derogation of title means. Derogation is I'm doing something that interferes with the owner's title. That I'm doing something that title to what? To the the eleven hundred dollars, for example. Does it exist? There is no eleven hundred dollars. Right, which means that the title transfer failed, which no, is a theft. Fail. No, it did fail because the title transfer was always the title transfer to an uncertain thing. That's correct. It's like the sale of no, a home. No, no. Let's go back to the weed. Let's go uh, back to the, to the soybean example. No, no, okay. no, no. Hold on. You're sneaking in a norm in, in this communication. You're sneaking in a norm that says if it exists. No, I say, no that can't it's be inherently part of the future. It's not that sneaking cannot in a be norm. Default. It's not a norm. It's, it's a condition that's necessarily – the future is necessarily uncertain. Yes. So that means that if I talk about a future thing, we're talking about things that don't exist yet. May or may not exist. That's right. Well, they don't exist now. They may or may not exist. I may have the eleven hundred dollars on, right? No, you you don't have the future eleven hundred on you now. Well, I could never have the future eleven hundred on me now. That's right. That. In fact, but, I don't have a. I only. I don't have any money. I'm penniless. I'm borrowing money from you because I need a thousand. You give me a thousand, and I spend the. Well, let's go back to this issue. Would you agree that when you loan me the one thousand, I guess I'm the snowball guy now. Yeah, when you loan me a thousand dollars. I need to spend the money to buy equipment and hire workers for my snowball stand, right? Okay. I can't do that unless I own the one thousand dollars, right? Lenders, I mean, presumably you could. I could condition. I could unconditionally transfer the thousand dollars to you today. You have to. It has. Or to be I could condition. conditionally transfer it. It can't be conditional. Sure. I, I do millions of dollars in conditional loans all the time. You may only use this loan for construction costs. No, you no, may no, not no. use I this loan for buy vacation. I mean, you can condition how I can use it, but I can. If I use it for the approved purpose, I have to be able to spend it. Sure, I which agree means with that. I have hundred percent title to it. I agree, which is which is why which means I'm you don't, have, you don't have, like you as a lender don't have a security interest in that money. I'm backtracking from my no. What I have is title to eleven hundred dollars. Correct. That's right. So you have you have no interest in that one thousand. That one thousand is gone. I agree with you. Unless I put when, it I, when I when I spent that money on my equipment, I was not taking your money without your permission. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly backtracking right. from my email to you. Yes. I agree. Right. right. I'm re I'm retreating from my email to you. I agree okay. that, that the thousand dollars, if it's an okay, so we're talking we're talking about the future one eleven hundred. So. So that so then let's forget about the one thousand. Let's just simply say, let's say I make a gift to you. I say, hey Jeff, I hereby give you a eleven hundred dollars of the of the property that I own right. in one year. Right. Because that of the property I own is an is an inherent necessary condition because I can't transfer to you future property that I don't. Let's let's make it even simpler. Let's say, hey Jeff, I'm a 
I'm a bankrupt guy on the street of San Francisco, and I have no I, – I, I own nothing. I only own this T-shirt that I'm wearing. That's it. But I hereby give you $1,100 uh -huh. right now. Right. Have I, when I say that to you, have I stolen anything from you? No. Why not? Um, you haven't stolen anything because, because I haven't, there hasn't been an exchange of titles. No, we, 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 forget about exchange. Let's, just, let's assume we can make a one-way transfer. Well, I don't, I don't, I mean, certainly a gift that you can, you can transfer a title gratuitously. Okay. You can transfer a title so, so, as a gift. Jeff, I hereby give you as a gift, $1,100. Right. But right. And you say, okay, hand it over. And I say, oh, I don't have any money. That's right. That's different than if I give you $1,000 now. Why, why, why is it different? Be, be, because I wouldn't have given you the $1,000, but for the chain, the, the, the transfer of title. I disagree. When you give me the $1,000 now, you know that I'm giving you a thousand. You know that I'm giving you a future uncertain thing. You know, you're taking a risk. Yes, there's certainly a risk. That's that's for sure. But the so is the is, borrower. The risk is that I might not have the money. So is the borrower. The bar and the and if the borrower doesn't, it's a theft. That's that's it's the not, William that's the Everson Roth. This is the this is the different difference we have. So what you're saying is the risk that the lender is taking is that I might turn out to be a thief. Yes. But all that means is you're saying that if I turn out not to have the eleven hundred dollars in the future, you're characterizing that as an act of theft. Yes. But you haven't explained why. Why why yes. is it not? Be because I gave you the, I gave you title to my thousand dollars a year. Previously. That doesn't matter. Sure, it does. Sure, it, it doesn't does. matter why you gave me the thousand dollars. Sure, it does. It absolutely does. That's the difference. You're sure it does, but I have to go, so I have to practice law. I don't agree with you. I know that's why this is why I want to ferret I mean, out. I don't agree that you have to go. Oh well, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> we should continue this. Yeah, I don't have to practice law, so I don't think you have to. Unfortunately, I have a. Yes, I do. So, Jeff, you know what's nice? Retirement. Just retire. Soon. Soon. You see this gray hair? Soon. Okay. I enjoyed this, but I think I think it's good because we got to the crux of our disagreement. We it's are at the crux of our disagreement. One issue about whether the and this is what Rothbard and Evers make a mistake on when they talk about uh debtor's prison and yes, you're unable to pay your future debt, you're an implicit thief. But there's no such thing thief. in my lexicon as implicit theft. I don't know what implicit theft is. No, I agree. You're an explicit thief. Okay. Well, I don't think either one makes sense. So let's do that as part two, maybe. Perfect. I'll give you the last word. Thanks, Stefan. Are you okay if I publish this or not? Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. Talk to you later. Love you, brother. Take care. Bye-bye now. Love you too. Take care.